The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. If you're looking for French interpretation, please click the interpretation button on the bottom right of your screen and you should be able to find French uh, there for, for you to listen to. Just a little bit about Project ECHO etiquette. ECHO is, found, is founded on love and respect. Please respond kindly to people um, rather than react if you disagree. It is everybody's responsibility to keep ECHO a safe space. Please test your equipment ahead of time, both audio and video, and introduce yourself before speaking if you are gonna speak. Please avoid making too much noise, shuffling papers, cell phones, loud bags, etc. For questions during the Q&A session, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna be taking questions that way. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking, which is on the left bottom corner of your screen. And if you are to speak, please remember again to unmute your button and speak close to the microphone. Position your webcam effectively to show your face if alone or to capture the whole group. Have a light source from the, the front so you avoid being backlit. And if you have any IT issues, please send a, a message to us through the chat email function. You can send it to SSAC Echo and we can help answer any of your questions. I'm now going to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Bontayu Seleshi. He is an assistant professor of cardiothoracic anesthesiology and directs the Cardiothoracic Fellowship Program at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee in the United States. Dr. Seleshi, originally from Ethiopia, is also highly involved in education capacity building programs for anesthesia providers in East Africa. Over to you, Dr. Bon. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually uh, just going to do a brief um, introduction of our uh, speaker today. But before I do that, um, since we're kind of in the middle of the series, uh, I thought I'd highlight uh, the topics that we have already covered um, as you have access to these um, lectures uh, via video. So we started um, our series uh, with a talk from Dr. Massion on respiratory clinical uh, symptoms and treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Massion um, covered how to recognize uh, the pathogenicity of uh, uh, COVID-19 how it presents uh, and some imaging modalities, how to diagnose it um, uh, and how to uh, take care of it uh, in the ICU. Um, next slide, please. That was followed by a um, presentation by Dr. Schlesinger and team, um, really honing down even further on um, ICU care and ventilation strategy uh, for these patients. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, on their talk, they nicely summarized the presentation and the diagnosis of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, they went over specific um, algorithms uh, for COVID-19 respiratory support uh, in the ICU um, and a, a nice discussion on prone positioning um, in addition to anticoagulation protocol. Next slide, please. That was followed by um, a presentation by Dr. Banerjee and team on multi-system organ failure and sepsis. Next slide, please. And on their presentation a couple of days ago, uh, they really went um, uh, in systems-based fashion, um, covering um, you know, different organ systems that are affected and how to manage them in the ICU. Um, so I'm reviewing these topics for you if any of these um, topics are of interest for you, uh, please feel free to go to our website uh, and view these videos which are available uh, and which uh, are nicely done. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're gonna specifically focus on uh, cardiovascular disease uh, in the setting of COVID-19 infection, uh, talking about the clinical features and the management um, we are very fortunate to have <clears throat> Dr. Henry Okafor, uh, 
um, who is the director of the Vanderbilt uh, Meheri Cardiology, um, uh, originally from Nigeria, um, and a good friend of ours. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Henry. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, let's uh, proceed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, nothing to disclose here. Next. So today, our learning objectives will be to look at the spectrum of cardiovascular disease in COVID-19 and also review uh, some of the clinical features uh, as they are changing every day. We'll discuss um, the approach to uh, de la maladie cardiovasculaire. Vascular, uh, uh, managing cardiovascular complications. And we also highlight some of the potential adaptations in low resource settings. Next slide. Um, I'd like to lead off um, with um, uh, uh, cas, en fait. case presentations uh, to give us an idea of some of these um, uh, features we're going to be talking about. Next slide, please. I start off with a 55-year-old man with a history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes mellitus who had uh, previously known heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 20%. Um, he presented with one-week history of uh, progressive dyspnea or mild exertion, uh, which was not totally unusual in his condition, and then uh, complicated by three days of exertional angina, which was entirely new. Uh, on presentation, he was hypertensive, uh, but febrile, um, and oxygenating at 96 to 98% on room air. He had positive bivalvular crackles, elevated jugular venous distension, um, estric gallop, two plus bilateral pitting edema, all consistent with acutely decompensated heart failure. Next slide, please. Um, the workup revealed EKG with normal sinus rhythm and premature atrial contractions, left axis deviation, non-specific T wave changes, um, uh, elevated troponin of 1.07, uh, pro BMP was 22,000. He had cardiomegaly and pulmonary vascular congestion, and evidence of biventricular failure on 2D echo with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 20%. He had grade three diastolic dysfunction and small uh, posterior pericardial effusion without any tamponade physiology. Next slide, please. Uh, on the left hand, you can see his uh, EKG as mentioned, uh, especially in sinus rhythm with PACs. And on the right, you can see his chest X-ray showing significant cardiomegaly and my pulmonary vascular congestion, but otherwise, uh, uh, nothing, no clear infiltrates. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, four chamber epical view of the uh, echocardiogram on steel images. On the left, you see, uh, this, you have the left ventricle, um, the right, uh, left atrium, and you have the right ventricle, all the chambers look uh, mildly enlarged. And you can see on the right that the, there is some tricuspid uh, regurgitation and mild tricuspid regurgitation and trace uh, mitral regurgitation we are present, which we are mainly functional. Next slide, please. Um, patient was treated with intravenous diuresis and improved significantly until on the third day when he uh, spiked a temperature to 101.7 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, became relatively hypoxic um, with increasing uh, demand for oxygen supplementation. Septic workup was initiated and uh, inflammatory markers were all elevated, including C-reactive protein, um, uh, fibrinogen, ferritin, and D-dimer. Uh, he tested positive for COVID-19, which was done uh, later, and um, needed hydroxychloro uh, needed to be treated uh, with azithromycin only uh, because his uh, baseline QT was prolonged. So the infectious disease uh, selected not to 
treat with hydroxychloroquine. Um, his hypoxia improved and his fever uh, resolved. Uh, he was discharged on day 15. Next slide, please. Um, the second case is a 68-year-old woman with also hypertension and type 2 diabetes who was already uh, tested positive for COVID-19 10 days earlier, uh, but presented subsequently with respiratory distress and um, immediately required mechanical ventilation. Uh, she seemed to be doing well until day five when she became acutely uh, tachycardic and hypotensive and required vasopressors. Uh, septic walk-off was initiated. Um, she what was, um, uh, echocardiogram was ordered. Uh, next slide, please. And the two-day echo showed that she now has a severely impaired LV systolic function uh, with EF of 25 to 30%. She was not previously known to have any uh, uh, heart failure or cardiomyopathy. So she required inotropic support with low-dose dibutamine um, and um, hemodynamic stabilized over the next 24 to 48 hours. And a repeat to the echocardiogram uh, seven days later showed uh, almost normalized left ventricular systolic function with EF of 45 to 50%. Next slide, please. Uh, talking a little bit about the epidemiology of this COVID-19, uh, obviously I started off uh, in Wuhan and now a pandemic uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2. We know there has been a previous SARS-CoV-1 and uh, MERS. Uh, it's primarily a respiratory disease. Um, with extensive interaction with the cardiovascular system, and as we know now, with most other organs too. Um, you do have uh, patients with cardiovascular disease are known to be at higher risk of getting this infection, and they have a worse outcome. Also, cardiovascular complications are relatively common in these uh, patients. In some series, it's as high as 20-30% uh, of these patients get uh, cardiovascular complications. Uh, and some of the current treatment are known to also cause uh, cardiovascular complications such as arrhythmias. Next slide, please. Uh, in this study published in uh, JAMA uh, in the past month showed that in those with um, cardiovascular disease uh, and elevated troponin who have COVID-19, uh, the mortality was the highest when compared to those with that cardiovascular disease and normal troponin. So the graph, the line on the top is those with cardiovascular disease and elevated troponin, whereas the lowest or the best survivor were those with cardiovascular disease, without cardiovascular disease and normal troponin. In between, you notice that even in patients who uh, have cardiovascular disease but had normal troponin, had a better survivor than those with cardiovascular disease who had elevated troponin, telling us that the elevation of troponin is a marker of poor prognosis in these patients with um, uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, we also, this uh, study just confirms that uh, cardiovascular disease is a pretty uh, is pretty uh, common in COVID-19 uh, patient. In, this, in the largest study uh, from uh, China, it showed that 10.5% of those patients had um, cardiovascular disease, uh, while 7.3% had diabetes, and 6.5% had hypertension. In, in some studies, a little bit reversed, but this is just telling us about the uh, frequency of uh, cardiovascular disease and or cardiovascular disease risk factors in patients with COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, diverse of, uh, cardiovascular diseases are seen. Uh, patients can come with pre-existing cardiovascular disease as in our first case, uh, hypertension, heart failure, coronary artery disease, arrhythmias. But there are also um, SARS-CoV-2 related uh, cardiovascular disease that is being observed. Uh, heart failure will reduce ejection fraction, uh, sometimes going into cardiogenic shock, uh, 
Uh, some are coming with acute MI, both uh, STEMIs and non-STEMIs, that's ST elevation myocardial infarction and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Also, uh, with a lot of mimicas uh, in form of myocarditis uh, showing up even on your EKGs. Um, thromboembolism is a, a rising concern um, and arrhythmias, of course. And also treatment-related cardiotoxicity of some of the medications and uh, complications uh, of arrhythmias from this uh, treatment is other things to pay attention to. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So here uh, we, we see the frequency of cardiac injury. This study actually was uh, a little conservative. I mean, we can see that acute cardiac injury as defined by elevation in uh, cardiac troponin was 7.2 overall, but as high as 22% in those patients in the critical care unit, uh, which means the, worse, the more severe the illness, uh, the more the myocardial damage. Also, arrhythmia was as common as 44% in these uh, patients with uh, uh, severe disease in the critical care unit. Next slide, please. A little bit on the pathogenesis. I know it's been discussed in previous uh, presentation, but here we know that SARS-CoV-2 is a single-strand RNA virus, which enters the human cells uh, mainly by binding to the H2 uh, receptors. Uh, which are highly expressed in the lung alveolar cells and also on cardiac myocytes and vascular endothelium. Um, this will lead to mild to moderate viral illness and can progress, as we have seen, to systemic inflammatory response syndrome and ARDS and even multi-organ involvement. Next slide, please. Uh, several mechanisms of myocardial injury has been postulated. Um, if we go from uh, the 12 o'clock position and go clockwise, you could see that um, you could have a direct viral uh, cardiomyocyte uh, toxicity because it can affect the cardiomyocyte, as we've just said, can attach to H2 uh, receptor and cause that. Um, it can also cause a lot of uh, microtrombi and uh, thromboembolism will lead to microvascular dysfunction and even myocardial infections. Um, vasculitis, endothelial dysfunction, uh, even stress-induced cardiomyopathy. There are the cytokine storm or hyperinflammatory state will lead also to um, this uh, myocardial injury. And in patients who may already have uh, coronary artery disease, you could get plaque rupture causing a true myocardial infarction. Um, also bear in mind that the increased metabolic demands and hypoxia and hypotension all combine to create a demand supply mismatch, uh, oxygen demand supply mismatch, which could also result in myocardial injury. Next slide, please. Um, the combination of all these increased inflammatory response and decrease in cardiopulmonary uh, function, all combined to cause a significant myocardial injury, including conduction system disease, uh, leading to decompensated heart failure, acute coronary syndrome, uh, myocarditis, hypotension, as we have seen in our cases, and um, tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, drug-induced uh, increase in QT interval, which could lead to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or to SARS the point, and um, sudden cardiac death. All these are possibilities uh, from this uh, myocardial injury. Next slide, please. Um, so given this, we we'll need to uh, review some general principles in the management of this COVID-19 patient. Uh, there have been some recommendations from the American College of Cardiology and European Society of Cardiology and other professional societies on guiding uh, the management. Uh, but here, I think first and foremost, it's important for every center to establish some protocols for effective clinic, clinical triage. Uh, typically, in, in some hospitals, they have people in PPEs questioning and triaging patients right from the front of the hospital, uh, 
asking screening questions, anyone with fever, cough, shortness of breath, contact with uh, a, a COVID-19 patient is separated right from the beginning. Uh, you want to do that quickly, you want to make a quick diagnosis and isolate potential uh, patients with COVID-19 and then identify those with uh, cardiovascular uh, disease uh, because they are at higher risk. Uh, you also want to individualize and limit your diagnostic testing to the essential tests that could facilitate management. Uh, this is not the time to do all, all kinds of tests. You want to do a quick clinical assessment to guide you. I consider using point of care testing to minimize um, um, transmission of this on healthcare workers to prevent other healthcare workers from getting infected where possible. Uh, universal precautions is essential, cannot be overemphasized. Personal protective equipment need to be worn uh, by all healthcare workers in caring for these patients. And you should use masks even for the patients also. And wherever possible, uh, telemedicine is a good way to go. Uh, we've been using it in our center. Uh, both for ambulatory care and even for those in the hospital, you can limit uh, healthcare worker contact by creating telemedicine even in the hospital for things that you can derive via telemedicine. But in other times, you have to actually go in in PPE. But if you use telemedicine even within the hospital, you can limit and conserve your uh, personal protective equipment so that only the few that actually need to be in the room go to the room and they stay in that uh, room and take care of the patient until there's a change in shift. Next slide, please. Um, for specific management of acute coronary syndrome, I just want to make a quick highlight that um, in, in these times, if, there are, if the patient has clear risk factors for coronary artery disease, and definitive uh, clinical evidence to support or suggest uh, acute coronary syndrome. Um, consider fibrinolytic therapy if it's a STEMI or uh, manage uh, medically uh, for non-STEMI or stable angina. And in the high-risk group, if you have the capability, get CT coronary angiogram that will help you to define non-invasively uh, the presence of obstructive coronary artery disease. Or otherwise. Next slide, please. This is a repetition or summary of what I've just said, uh, a kind of triage algorithm to look at your ST elevation and decide whether to go uh, straight to high risk primary PCI or not. Of course, if you don't have PCI capability, medical management uh, using fibrinolytics uh, might be your best option. Next slide, please. Again, uh, similar to the previous one, this is if you don't have a cat lab and you have a nearby cat lab that you can refer your patient to, uh, consider, uh, of course, you need to talk to the physicians over there and make sure that you are able to um, identify whether this patient needs to be isolated from beginning. And then those places that have cat lab need a dedicated cat lab for the COVID-19 patients. You don't want to be using the same cat lab for both COVID-19 positive and COVID-19 negative patient, even if it's potential. Next slide, please. Heart failure and cardiogenic shock are seen in our second case. Uh, it's another uh, common presentation uh, that healthcare workers need to look out for. Um, a bedside clinical assessment is going to be key. Um, many times, because you can also have septic shock, you want to differentiate between septic shock and uh, cardiogenic shock. And on the bedside, quick physical exam, cold, tready, uh, cold uh, clammy extremities uh, with um, hypotension and tready pulse, uh, jugular venous distension, all will be supportive of cardiogenic shock rather than septic shock. And you could use point of care ultrasound if you have that, or 2D echocardiogram. Uh, even for just a limited view, you want to minimize the time of contact if possible. And if you confirm heart failure, guideline directed medical therapy, including S inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, are recommended. You know that the most recent studies have come out in support of uh, angiotensin uh, S inhibitors and ABS. Uh, initially, this was controversial, but now we know that it is safe and, in fact, might be beneficial. 
Uh, so if the patient goes into cardiogenic shock, uh, consider the use of inotropic support and vasopressors, uh, preferably the dutamine uh, by drip or norepinephrine uh, and vasopressin. Um, ideally, you want to give this through a central line uh, where possible, but if you don't have a central line, uh, put a large ball uh, IV lines like 18 gauge and above uh, to administer these uh, anotropic or vasopressors. Um, where you have the capability here in the US, uh, extracorporeal membrane uh, oxygenation or even impeller is being used, uh, but I know that in low resource settings, this may not be an option. So uh, anotropic support will, might be your key uh, to managing these patients. Next slide, please. Tumbrum embolism is another uh, big issue uh, in COVID-19. Next slide. Um, as you will see, the risk factors for thromboembolism, I know uh, obviously most of these patients come in with it, they have an acute illness, they have fever, they might be septic, they have heart failure, they have malignancies or COPDs. These patients are all at risk, uh, given that, and you get a massive inflammatory response with increase in C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. And elevation in D-dimer has been demonstrated to be another strong marker for poor prognosis. And in those patients with elevated D-dimer, um, more than 1.5, they are very high risk of having uh, pulmonary embolism or a different thrombosis and need to be anticoagulated because all of that, if not taken care of, results in thromboembolism, myocardial infarction, and sometimes disseminated intravascular coagulations. So patients need to be uh, prophylaxed for thromboembolism and we are diagnosed. Uh, sometimes you're not able to do a CT angiogram quickly. Uh, you could get uh, an echo, uh, EKG, and a clinical assessment to guide you. Uh, start anticoagulation, uh, preferably with low molecular weight heparin. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, slide is just to show you that the more critical or severe the illness at the top of the pyramid, the most uh, severe cases have the worst uh, thromboembolism. Therefore, the sicker your patient is, the higher their risk. Therefore, you should give priority in terms of uh, treating or prophylaxing for uh, thromboembolism in the very sick patients. Next slide, please. Um, emphasizing the same thing, most of the inflammatory markers are going to be high, uh, including elevated D-dimer uh, and high procal cetonin. Um, you could confirm DVT uh, PE with uh, ultrasound, venous ultrasound, uh, if, if you have it. Um, if otherwise, uh, you can do a CTA and confirm uh, PE. Uh, you should start anticoagulation as soon as you have that suspicion or you risk stratify the patient and start uh, prophylaxis. Here, generally, most patients uh, get, um, most patients do get DVT prophylaxis on hospitalization. Uh, next slide, please. Arrhythmias are another uh, challenge to deal with in COVID-19 patients. And um, most of the proposed treatment like hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin, particularly when combined, are known to prolong the QT. And with prolonged QT, you are at high risk of developing uh, to SARS the point or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, therefore, you have to get baseline EKG and assess uh, the acute corrected QT. If more than 500 milliseconds, you might want to hold off giving these uh, medications, or if you must give it, ensure that you take countermeasures to reduce the risk and monitor them closely using EKGs and or telemetry, or even sometimes mobile phone uh, with some of these apps, you can still check uh, their QT uh, even remotely. Um, you can correct particularly potassium, magnesium, and calcium uh, to minimize the risk. And you have to be cautious with diuretics as this will further deplete your electrolytes um, you know, when, when you give them. Um, 
tachycardia might actually be a, a good thing in that case um, because it's less likely, the patients are less likely to develop uh, uh, to science in the presence of uh, tachycardia. And of course, if the patient goes on to develop sustained uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, obviously with hemodynamic instability, you need to do a DC cardioversion uh, to correct and uh, get them back to sinus rhythm. Next slide, please. So in, in summary, the manifestations of uh, cardiovascular disease in COVID-19 can be diverse. Uh, the patients might pre present as angina, as unstable angina, as acute coronary syndrome, or even as heart failure, or uh, uh, mimickers of uh, myocardial infections. So it's quite diverse. It's important to establish, a rehearse, and follow your protocols. Um, have maybe dedicated ward and dedicated ICU, and where, uh, where you have it, uh, capability, even dedicated CAT lab. Uh, for COVID-19 patients. Uh, maintain consistent universal precautions, tailor your care to the individual needs of the patient, and avoid unnecessary testing. Wherever possible, point of care testing will help minimize uh, healthcare worker exposure uh, while optimizing your care for the patient. Adapt the care, of course, to the available resources in your center, and um, use telemedicine as much as possible and that has been you know, very much uh, um, upregulated here in the US. We're doing a lot of ambulatory care via telemedicine and even within the hospital, telemedicine can facilitate your care while minimizing uh, uh, transmission to healthcare workers. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening. We'll be happy to take some questions at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Okafor, for that presentation. That was fantastic. Uh, we are going to transition to Q&A uh, right now. Again, please, if you have any questions, type them into the chat box, um, and we will try to get to them. I would just like to introduce Dr. Mark Newton now, who's going to moderate the Q&A session. Dr. Mark Newton is a pediatric anesthesiologist and the Director of Global Health and Development for the Department of Anesthesiology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Newton is also a consultant anesthesiologist at AIC Kajabe Hospital in Kajabe, Kenya. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, uh, Dr. Okafor and Shilashi. We want to open it up to uh, questions. And so there have been a number of questions that have come in advance of the lecture, but also some lectures through the chat. So continue sending your questions. So I'll try to group these and so we can learn during this time. But I would just encourage everyone on the on the lecture to continue sending in questions. And as the speakers answer these questions, if something comes up, just uh, send us a message to the chat and we will We'll watch those. So the first question I'd like to ask, and we're asking in advance, or is the whole thing about ACE receptor cells. Can you go over a little bit about where these are located? I know you mentioned it in your lecture, but specifically talk about why potentially in hypertensive patients and diabetic patients, maybe there's a change in the baseline of ACE receptors. And, and just many patients in Africa are on ACE inhibitors. And what, we, what should we do in this scenario? Um, for those patients. So a little bit about the pathophysiology of the receptor cells and how they work, but also about the ACE inhibitors on a practical level, what we should, should we do in Africa? Thank you, that's a very good question. So S, in, S receptors, uh, particularly S2 receptors, are then known to be uh, highly expressed on the alveolar cells, but also on the cardiac myocytes and um, in, on the GI. So they are in multiple organs, but highest density, of course, is in the lungs and the myocardium. And all the current studies, uh, even before these studies came out, I know there was controversy as, as to the upregulation of S2, uh, what that, the implications for that for treating with ACE inhibitors or apps. Uh, but the most recent uh, studies uh, clearly confirm that it is safe. It is safe to treat your patients either the hypertensives or those who had uh, premorbid heart failure 
to continue the treatment with ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. So you don't need to stop those medications. And in fact, um, the studies suggest that it might be uh, beneficial as we have known before. So do not stop your ACE inhibitors. Uh, you should continue them and they're still recommended. Uh, so, Dr. Okafor, if someone comes in and they're not on ACE inhibitors, but we feel that would help with their cardiac failure, should we go ahead and start those, or should we start another drug that's used in our system? Uh, good, good question. If they are hemodynamically stable, if they are not hypotensive, it is reasonable to use ACE inhibitors um, and in our arms, as the case might be. But of course, if these patients are having hypotension, you have to avoid um, S inhibitors at that point until they stabilize. Uh, these, these are very beneficial in patients with cardiomyopathy and heart failure. It's been demonstrated to improve survival in multiple prior studies. So we support the use of S inhibitors and uh, sometimes you know, also uh, beta blockers, but you don't want to initiate beta blockers when the patient is acutely uh, volume overloaded. You want to initiate that when the patient gets uvolemic. So S inhibitors are recommended, except in uh, hypertension or cardiogenic shock. Okay, thank you. Of course, where they may be allergic. Sometimes the patient, a lot of patients may be allergic to S inhibitors with cough, or they may have clear anaphylactic uh, reactions, in which case you totally avoid that. Mm -hmm. So based upon your experience in, in Nigeria, uh, one of my concerns is, and people have voiced that, is that there's a lot of cardiac disease in general. And so now we're going to miss that cardiac disease that's at baseline pre-COVID. And now someone comes in with some symptoms and we think it's COVID. How, how should we just practically differentiate those? Um, if I understood your question well, if somebody had prior cardiac disease, Yes, for example, we know that in Africa, people, there, there's patients that come in with cardiac disease, you know, pre-COVID. I mean, these are people that it's just a normal. And yeah. so now they come in and we're, we're all worked up about COVID yeah. and we want to think it's COVID, but it's just their baseline illness that's in the country. And so how should we differentiate between treating them for COVID or just treating their, their baseline cardiac disease that's in the country? Okay, so uh, I think as I've mentioned before, uh, it's important to screen your patients. And um, uh, often, even here, we pre-screen the patient even before they get to the hospital. Or if, uh, if they are at the hospital, they are screened right from the gate or from the lobby, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Questions about fever, cough, shortness of breath, contact with anybody uh, who may have tested positive or who is uh, being treated for COVID-19 it's important to screen all comers uh, mm -hmm. because we know that you have asymptomatic uh, uh, transmitters who are uh, walking around, not even having any symptoms. So, so screen your patient, even if they had cardiovascular disease at baseline, we know that they are at higher risk of getting the infection when they, they, when they have had cardiovascular disease. Therefore, it is a good, reasonable thing to screen them but at the same time, you should not avoid treating your patients. A part of cases of mishaps where, because somebody said they're short of breath, everybody flipped out saying it's COVID-19 and they didn't want to be infected. They left the patient. The patient may just be in heart failure, like you mm -hmm. said, or mm -hmm. having clear angina, which is still very treatable. And in any case, um, you are, all the healthcare workers in the hospital should be wearing masks, should be uh, having their PPEs to be able to screen these patients and triage them quickly. And if there is good reason to suspect COVID, at least isolate them until you rule them out for COVID-19. Uh, that's part of what we do here. If we have reason to suspect, there's a combination of uh, pre-morbid cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. You isolate the patient uh, in a respiratory room and continue your treatment and send for the test and usually uh, you get it back the test within 24 to 48 hours and you're able to say okay patient is COVID negative you continue your regular treatment if patient is COVID positive of course you get uh, infectious disease involved and you you know initiate appropriate therapy as indicated okay thank you thank you very much so the second subject is the whole idea of tr uh, troponins and uh, measurements for 
cardiac disease. What do we do if we're not able to measure those? And can we still treat COVID-19 COVID patients with cardiac disease without that lab? And are there any substitutes that we can use to follow uh, when we don't have that lab available to us? And maybe you can explain what, why we would measure that just at baseline. What, what is that? Um, I, actually, some authorities are not encouraging you to just routinely check troponin, except it's indicated, because as has been observed in uh, most of the literature, 20 to 30 percent of the patients are going to have elevated troponin. And elevated troponin is just a marker of uh, myocardial injury, so which we've said is relatively common in this condition. Mm -hmm. and one problem with uh, checking troponin is that everybody gets carried away once the troponin is positive. Oh, it's an MI and you know they, they have something else to deal with. But the reality is that, especially in stress um, or sepsis or any kind of um, a significant uh, critical illness, troponin can be elevated. And if troponin elevation, as we saw uh, in the, uh, some of my earlier slides, does not necessarily mean acute myocardial infarction. So this could just be um, demand, which means the patient is hypoxic or anemic or you know, hypotensive. So if you correct the underlying problem, like hypoxia or hypotension, um, that stress on the heart will be eliminated. Um, if in a few cases, it's true plaque rupture. So you want to say, does the patient have angina? along with the troponin, or even before you check troponin, is this patient having a, a typical angina symptoms? Are there EKG um, evidence like ST elevation or ST depression to suggest ischemia? If none of those, if you don't have clinical and maybe EKG evidence to suggest acute coronary syndrome, it may not necessarily be a good idea to be checking uh, troponin um, uh, just as a prognostic marker, we know that it, the higher the troponin, the worse the outcome. But you can use D-dimer for that, okay? So D-dimer, it's a strong prognostic marker. So and it can tell you also about uh, thromboembolism. So except your patient is having clinical features to make you concerned about um, acute coronary syndrome, you don't have to worry that you don't have uh, troponin available in your center. Um, mm -hmm. You could do uh, creatine kinase. But most of that is going to be elevated because of the muscles, uh, mm -hmm. the muscle breakdown. That's not being the typical thing. Troponin is more uh, sensitive. Okay. Okay, great. And you mentioned uh, also checking DNP. C can you describe what what that what you're looking for? Whether we have it or not, we can discuss that. But what what is that? Okay, the natriuretic peptide uh, is is secreted uh, by the heart. Um, the ventricles in times of stress, either high pressure or high volume, anything that stretches the uh, myocardium or stretches the uh, ventricular chambers will cause an elevation in B natriuretic peptide. And that's what you measure. Some people measure pro BMP, which is the, uh, uh, the preformed uh, BMP, and you can use that or you can use the BMP. So the more elevated typically uh, this is, the more likely that the patient has heart failure. But again, as said, if you have high intraventricular pressures, um, as in PE or um, even severe hypertensive crisis, the BMP can get elevated. So you don't want to check that routinely, except you suspecting the patient has heart failure or decompensated heart failure or severe cardiomyopathy, uh, that would be another biomarker telling you how serious uh, their heart failure might be. That's why you check it. Okay, great. So the fourth uh, kind of topic that people had questions regarding was the whole idea of this thromboembolism and um, the effect that it has on the body. So the questions are, um, have we seen an increased incidence of pulmonary hypertension in these patients, and that uh, sildenafil is available in, in some countries in Africa. Should we um, routinely use this if we do not have a transthoracic echo or TEE or anything like that, just from clinical signs? And then 
Uh, so let's maybe answer that one, then I'll ask some other questions about uh, the whole idea about thromboembolic events. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, the, if you suspect uh, thromboembolism, um, I mean, you could do from clinical uh, evaluation, is the patient getting more short of breath, more hypoxic? Um, is there maybe hypotension if they have like PE? Uh, you could also use EKG if there is tachycardia or evidence of right-sided uh, strain, uh, like um, right axis deviation uh, in, in the presence of tachycardia. That might suggest uh, a PE. Um, you could get a non-invasive study like a quick look to the echocardiogram. If you see evidence of right ventricular strain, uh, that might also suggest a PE. Now, because this is an acute event, the, uh, uh, you might not necessarily have pulmonary hypertension uh, mm -hmm. right away. And if you have it, it might be transient. So the appropriate treatment will be anticoagulation uh, more than trying to reduce uh, the pressure because the primary problem is the uh, thromboembolism. So if you can correct that with anticoagulation, you might be able to uh, uh, relieve uh, the consequences of that with you know, transient elevation in the pulmonary pressures. So I would not recommend uh, initiating sildenafil uh, on every patient uh, because of that, because you're treating, you're not really treating the main problem. The thromboembolism is the main issue there. And anticoagulation would be a preferred treatment uh, okay. to alleviate that. Okay. And so you mentioned in your talk about putting, you know, placing patients that are inpatients on anticoagulants yes. and low molecular weight heparin. What, what if we, we do, do not have that? All we have is heparin. And is there any kind of protocol that, that we can use for an inpatient, for everyone um, that comes in that's sick enough that's requiring oxygen um, for anticoagulation? Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have low molecular weight heparin and you have unfractionated heparin, uh, that's a good option. Unfractionated heparin, uh, you know, can be used uh, uh, for prophylaxis. Actually, you know, just uh, given uh, uh, subcutaneously, uh, you can give unfractionated heparin for uh, DVT prophylaxis. And um, if you do have um, thromboembolism that is confirmed, you might need to put them on the on the on the drip uh, mm -hmm. and titrate uh, uh, your uh, PTT uh, to between forty to sixty uh, to keep them uh, adequately anticoagulated and and treat uh, uh, your thromboembolism. So yes, absolutely. If you need to, you can use off fractionated heparin, and if you don't have that, you can use uh, SCDs, which are uh, commonly used uh, in post-op patients, uh, pneumatic uh, compression. Uh, devices to mm -hmm. uh, help uh, prevent uh, deep vein thrombosis. So all those options are acceptable. Um, the thing is, uh, one of the challenges, of course, with unfractionated heparin is that you require more intensive monitoring and more staff resources. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody has to keep ch check the uh, PTT, make sure the patient is adequately anticoagulated and not excessively or overly anticoagulated where you can cause bleeding. So you need to titrate more often and you need to monitor it. Whereas low molecular weight heparin allows you to give you know, um, one dose maybe twice a day and mm -hmm. reduce uh, uh, staff uh, use and resources uh, with that. So that's why maybe nurses and healthcare workers would prefer low molecular weight heparin where available, but unfractionated heparin is definitely an alternative. Okay. If I can, uh, Mike, if I can just add to that, yes. um, I think uh, prevention would go a long way. So any patient that is admitted in the hospital, being very aggressive with making sure that uh, they're mobile, um, if they are able to walk, even, you know, with the oxygen and the nasal cannula, make sure that they walk. Um, and if they're bedridden, um, even doing passive, um, you know, leg motions, um, if you don't have compression devices, even manually compressing the legs uh, to reduce stasis um, can be helpful in preventing uh, clot formation. Okay, so are you saying, uh, Dr. Shleshi, that someone who's really 
ill in the hospital, we should be getting them out of bed and walking them around? Absolutely. If they have the ability to do so, we should definitely push to uh, have them be mobile because okay. it will significantly reduce uh, your likelihood of um, clot formation. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, uh, from my many years in Africa, that's one thing that has changed over the years is that we tend to have patients sitting and not out of bed. In the past, more patients were getting out of bed, so we need to encourage our nurses and the people on the wards to get patients out of the bed and have them move. Somebody asked about aspirin, and is there a role in aspirin, uh, you know, low-dose aspirin, either as an inpatient or as, as an outpatient to prevent any thromboembolic event, since we do use that at times for cardiac patients. Yes. Well, aspirin is an antiplatelet agent and um, it is useful, uh, but it's not proven uh, to prevent uh, other uh, thromboembolism. Uh, I've not seen that data. So um, using it alone um, may not be as effective in preventing thromboembolism. Of course, if somebody's ambulatory and able to move around, um, I think um, that's one, one good way of preventing thromboembolism. Um, if, you, if someone is in the hospital and you have reasons to suspect or maybe they have high risk for acute coronary syndrome or they already have coronary artery disease and we're on aspirin prior to hospitalization, it's a good thing to continue the aspirin. Uh, because that reduces their risk of uh, acute coronary syndrome. So that would be a case where I use it, but uh, using it uh, for prophylaxis, for DVT, uh, is not proven, uh, uh, you know, uh, therapy. Okay. Not helpful. Okay, so and another question was about inotropic support. And uh, I know on your slide it had mentioned the use of dobutamine and norepi and uh, a vasopressin, things like that. Now, what about um, if we do not have those? What are the main drugs at our government hospital? We only have adrenaline, and, and every once in a while we can get dopamine. So, mm -hmm. so what would you suggest that we do in that situation? And also, as you're commenting, the role of calcium and, and checking calcium in these types of patients. I see. Um, Van, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, Yes, uh, uh, I think um, epinephrine uh, is uh, an or adrenaline is an excellent um, choice in patients who have cardiogenic shock. Um, so obviously, titrating it to the correct um, uh, dose uh, would be helpful. Um, uh, and if you have the ability to, you know, uh, infusions that uh, uh, and able to control the dose, then you can really titrate it to help with the uh, ionotropy as well as uh, it serves as a vasopressor. Um, but if you don't have um, a, a way to um, you know, control the dose, you can even put epinephrine in a one liter uh, saline bag uh, and you know, change your uh, flow meters um, and titrate it to effect that way. Um, if you have uh, dopamine and you don't have uh, adrenaline, uh, dopamine can also be used, uh, but it's important to be mindful uh, that dopamine, in addition to um, uh, you know, affecting your uh, cardiac function, it could affect blood flow uh, to the renals uh, and so forth. Um, and its dopamine's uh, effect really changes based on the amount of uh, drug that you're giving. So okay. if I had a choice between epinephrine and dopamine, I personally would choose epinephrine. Um, it's a little bit more cleaner drug and really works on specifically on ionotropy uh, and increasing vasopressor uh, without uh, affecting other um, uh, organ systems. And then, Bon, any comments about calcium and inotropes and, uh, you know? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, cal calcium is, is a great ionotrope. Um, you want to make sure that you have adequate calcium level, um, but it's important for you to um, differentiate between um, a, you know, cardiogenic shock uh, and inadequate uh, supply um, uh, to the heart versus um, you know, 
uh, septic shock, which is leading to uh, cardiogenic shock. Um, so if it's, uh, if your problem is solely isolated to your heart, I'll be less inclined um, to use calcium. Uh, okay. But if it's more, you know, a combination of sepsis and cardiogenic shock, I'll be more inclined um, uh, to use uh, calcium and epinephrine and so forth. Great. Henry, do you want to add? Yeah, let me just mention that. Yeah, and thank you for that, that contribution, Dr. Sileshi. I, I think that um, if you are, whatever agent you have available in your center, uh, you should titrate to uh, mean arterial pressure of 60 to 65. Uh, that will kind of guide you. Uh, a mean arterial pressure of 60 to 65 allows adequate perfusion. So you don't need to give too much of any of these uh, vasopressors or inotropic agent because they all have their own uh, adverse effect, you know, uh, that will further cause an increased demand on the heart and accelerate myocardial injury. So that's something to pay attention to. Uh, generally speaking, you know, they are preferred, you know, like the butamine might be preferred, but where you don't have uh, the preferred anotropic agent, definitely um, go ahead with uh, dopamine, if that's what you have available, or adrenaline, but titrate it, don't need, don't need to give excessive doses. The titrate it uh, to just achieve a mean arterial pressure of 60 to 65 and you know, back up so you don't get the downside uh, uh, too much, okay? Yeah. Well, Mike, if I, could, yeah. if I can add one more thing. There were additional questions that were associated with vasopressor use and you know, central line versus uh, giving those in a peripheral line. Um, yeah. Yes, you can give inotropic agents uh, through peripheral IVs. Try to get you know as large uh, bore as an IV as you can, you know, 18 gauge and above, um, and try to put it um, on a on a larger vessel, you know, if possible, um, you know, close to the anticubital fossa or something larger. But yes, you can give. Um, uh, vasopressor agents peripherally as long as you monitor it carefully. Great. Well, we need to start wrapping this up. So uh, thank you both. It was a great lecture and uh, the Q&A session was active and uh, we learned a lot on the discussion. So we just want uh, Dr. Schlesch and Dr. Okafor to kind of give us 30 seconds or a minute to wrap it up and then we'll turn it over to Monica to finish up. I would just encourage everyone to join the WhatsApp group. There's many questions that we're going to have over the next week. So we do have a WhatsApp group and we have, it's multidisciplinary. So we have pulmonologists, cardiologists, ID, anesthesia, critical care. We can all try to respond. And so I would just encourage you to uh, sign up for the, that uh, WhatsApp group. So Bon, why don't you go first and then Dr. Okafor and then we'll turn it over to Monica. Sure. Um, uh, thank you again for, for this opportunity. Thank you for coming to listen to the talk. Um, you know, if I can just highlight it for me, what would be the key um, uh, takeaway points? Uh, one, know that uh, COVID-19 infection um, by itself, independent of whether a patient has a previous cardiovascular disease or not, can affect um, your cardiac function. And patients can have cardiovascular disease solely from the uh, COVID-19 infection. Um, so as you're caring for this patient, if you start with uh, a high suspicion and look for signs of uh, myocardial injury, you'll be better, uh, you might be um, better to, uh, you'll be able to better serve um, your patients. Um, the second point that I want to make is, um, you know, thromboembolic disease um, uh, is, is a big deal and has been associated with this in, uh, infection. Um, so uh, whenever possible, um, uh, use you know, prophylactic anticoagulation in addition to uh, encouraging uh, ambulation uh, to avoid um, uh, um, complications of that. Um, those, those are the kind of main takeaway points uh, for me. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Prefer. Thank you all for coming and thank you to assist and echo and thank you Dr. Sileshi uh, for your contributions. I appreciate that. Um, uh, as we've said, uh, COVID-19 um, comes with motor organ uh, uh, damage, particularly uh, uh, cardiac disease. 
other uh, de novo cardiac disease or pre-existing cardiac disease is made worse and patients with cardiovascular disease at higher risk of uh, poorer outcomes in this uh, condition. So it's important to initiate um, early preventive strategies. You cannot overemphasize the need for prevention, DVT prophylaxis and um, you know, uh, a quick care. But also at the same time, you need to stay safe. You need to use your PPEs and uh, universal masking, both for the healthcare worker and for the patient and uh, do quick screening and point of care uh, ultrasound. Uh, could be quite helpful in helping you uh, decide between uh, septic versus cardiogenic uh, effect in addition to your clinical assessment. Uh, those are things that will minimize uh, the chance, uh, chances of transmission while optimizing the care uh, for the patients. Uh, I know we're over time, but I appreciate your listening. I think we'll continue this on the WhatsApp uh, uh, forum if you sign in. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bond, Dr. Okafor, and Dr. Newton for that really interesting presentation. Um, thank you to Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health, GE Foundation, Project ECHO, and others um, for helping to put this together. I know we're over time, but two very quick last things for everyone. Um, I'm going to pass it along to my colleague, Claire, to uh, share the information on the WhatsApp group. And then we will be sharing a short poll. And if you could please fill that out before uh, we close today, that would be great. Thank you very much. Hi, so as was mentioned, we have a WhatsApp group for the series. We would love for you all to join. And you may use this WhatsApp group to continue asking questions or share what's happening with COVID in your area. You can scan this QR code that you see on the screen. We'll also be sending out a link to the group through your email if we have your email address. And if you have any other questions or if you want to get on our email list, you can email us at echo at assistinternational.org. Thanks.